All right. It's officially one o'clock. We can uh, we can get started. Uh, welcome. My name is Jeff Bartles. The uh, session that we're going to be doing now is called uh, "Take Your AutoCAD 2013 Renderings to the Next Level." I'm going to put up the uh, class summary here for a second, um, just so you can get an idea of where I'm going uh, with this session. Uh, what we're going to be talking about in here today is uh, some of the features and uh, concepts that aren't discussed in a uh, beginning rendering course. Uh, but the tools that we look at are, are extremely important. So the stuff we look at today is going to uh, increase the realism and the uh, quality of your rendered images. Uh, we're also going to talk about how we can increase the efficiency, uh, how we can take and render our images faster. As far as learning objectives, these are my goals. Now, this is my job. Uh, when you walk out of here, uh, my goal is that uh, you can take and create a virtual camera uh, such that you can set up and, and uh, set up for a rendering, take a photograph. Essentially, that's what we're doing when we render. We're, we're taking a picture of our 3D model. Uh, we're also going to look at how we can place targeted light sources, how we can create light that uh, has a direction. Okay. We're going to look at probably one of the most uh, important uh, things that you can do to increase the realism in a rendering. We're going to talk about bump maps. Uh, bump maps give us texture. Uh, yeah. If you know, if you look at anything, you know, most of the things around you, very, very few things in life are perfectly smooth. Uh, using bump maps, we can we can uh, add some uh, relief to our materials, which uh, goes a long way in, in uh, adding realism. Uh, we'll also talk about creating uh, cutout images. Typically, when we create a uh, material, uh, photo-based material, you know, photos are rectangular. You take and map that material on an object, you may think that you're restricted to a rectangular shape. Uh, we're going to look at how we can use an image to, to clip a material. Uh, we'll also talk about some tips and tricks for dealing with large rendered models. Um, rendering is a very iterative process. If you've rendered before, you, I'm sure you, you render, you look at it, you evaluate, you make some changes, you render it again. Uh, I'm going to show you some ways that we can render our drawings uh, as quickly as possible. And then finally, uh, we'll get into how we can create some animation. Uh, animation is nothing more than a, a series of still images. Uh, so AutoCAD allows us to create uh, animated cameras that we'll take um, over the course of time. Sometimes it could be a 24 hours, 36 hours. The camera will take and move through space and, uh, and take several hundred snapshots of your rendering to produce a, a, uh, an animation. Um, let me mention this. Uh, I am making the assumption that uh, everyone here has done some rendering before. Uh, in the event you have not, uh, everything should still work fine. I'm going to be talking about the hows and whys of what we do. Uh, if this is your first time talking about rendering, if, you're, if you are interested in filling in some of those gaps, some of the background, uh, you know, some of the beginner or inter uh, introductory level stuff, I am teaching a rendering course tomorrow, same time frame. Um, Different room, though. I think uh, South Seas G is where I'll be tomorrow. So if you're interested, uh, you can stop by and uh, love to see you. Just a couple things about myself. Uh, my name is Jeff Bartles. I've been using AutoCAD for a long time. Uh, I started back in release 12 the first time around for DOS. Uh, does anybody go back that far or farther? OK. All right. It's like a, it's like a family reunion in here. Um, Things were a lot different in those days. The rendering was uh, auto vision then. Pretty much just colored your, your objects based on the layer color. Now we, we have in AutoCAD the same uh, mental ray rendering engine that we have in 3ds Max. We just don't have access to all of the settings. Okay. Uh, I've been teaching AutoCAD for a long time. Uh, evenings, weekends, times when I should be sleeping and on vacation. I work for a company, a great company in California called lynda.com. Uh, I've produced several uh, video training titles for them. Has anybody ever seen one of my lynda.com videos? All right, got a couple people. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Uh, my day job, I work for another fantastic company called Siler Instruments. We are an authorized Autodesk reseller, and I am the uh, senior application uh, engineer for them. I provide training and technical support um, for AutoCAD, MAP, and Civil 3D through several Midwestern states. Okay, pretty much the last slide. The approach for this session, we are going to be looking at these features on a need, uh, at a uh, need-to-know basis. What do you need to know in order to use these tools? Since we're going to be covering a lot of ground today, 
uh, if we look at these items on a, on a need to know basis, we can, we can cover more material, lay some foundation. Uh, you'll have enough that uh, when you leave here, you'll be able to use the tools. And then as you continue to use the tools, you can start filling in some of those, uh, some of those additional gaps. Um, we will be rendering everything in here. Uh, for that reason, we'll be rendering small models. Small models render quickly. And uh, the nice thing is the concepts that we look at can be applied to models of any size. And then finally, this, this class will be uh, presented using a training approach. I'm not a big demo guy. I'm not big with the PowerPoint. I would prefer we spend our time working in the, in the software. Okay, I'm going to be talking about uh, hows and whys of what we do. And uh, one important thing, if you're a, a big note taker, I know that I am, um, you don't have to take notes if you don't want to. Uh, everything that we're doing in here is fully documented in the handout. In fact, all of the drawings that we work on in here um, are going to be available. Uh, there's a hyperlink in the, in the handout you can take and click on. You can, you'll be able to download them from a Dropbox account. Uh, as of this weekend, I'll have them posted. Um, what I did with the handout was I, I tried to give you what I want when I go to an AU presentation. I want to be able to go home Two months later, I want to be able to pull out the handout and be able to go through the material with, without having to look at my notes and try and remember, you know, have total recall of everything that I've seen. So, that being said, um, any questions at all before we get going? Fantastic. Our first topic, we're going to look at creating a virtual camera. Um, if I was creating an architectural rendering inside of a room, from a real world perspective, you know, what do you do? You go in, you set up a tripod, you put a camera on it, you aim it at your, uh, your subject, and then you take a picture. AutoCAD gives us a very similar workflow. Let me jump into AutoCAD here. I've got a nice uh, small abstract uh, example. And uh, let me say that I'm working with a fresh install of AutoCAD. I just put it on the machine a couple minutes ago, so I'd like to, uh, I'll have to adjust a couple settings. Uh, first of all, since I'm going to be working in 3D, I want to make sure that I'm using the 3D workspace. So I'll come down here and choose 3D modeling. I will then select the render tab. This is where all the tools are located that we'll be using in here. Now, uh, oddly enough, we have room, but uh, some of the panels that we're going to use are not displayed by default. If you right click on the ribbon, you can come down to show panels. You can see two of them are, are absent. I'm going to turn on the camera panel. And I will also right click here and we'll turn on animations. There we go. <clears throat> I'm going to do uh, one more thing. Uh, I'm going to uh, bring up my layers dialog box. Horribly old fashioned. I'm going to type that in and I will anchor this to the left side of my screen. There we go. We'll start by turning on this layer called marker one. Uh, in the drawing, if I orbit this a little bit, you can see I've got uh, a couple targets. One represents the location where I'm going to place my camera, point A, and then the other target represents the, what, you know, what I'm going to be pointing the camera at. So based on where these are located, if you try and visualize what this is going to look like, uh, we'll be having a, a very low perspective looking up at these pieces. To place a camera in the drawing, I'll come up to the camera panel and click Create Camera. I am now holding that camera from my cursor. I'll place this to the center of point A, and now it's asking me for target location. I'll point this at the center of point B. Now there are some settings here. We can adjust all of these later. For right now, I'm just going to hit enter. If you look down in the corner, you can see my camera is sitting it's down into the chessboard there a little bit. This is called a camera glyph. It will not print. It just displays on screen so you can see where the cameras are located. In the event you can't see the camera glyph, there happens to be a toggle right here that you can click to turn those guys on and off. Okay, let me make sure that's displayed. I'll pan this over a touch. If I select the camera glyph, it will bring up my preview. I'm used to working in a situation where I can actually see the screen. So if, if at any point something comes up and you can't see it at all, flag me down, let me know. Um, the camera preview that I have here, by default, it, it, the camera views uh, come up using the wireframe uh, visual style. If I open this up, I can select uh, another one, maybe uh, conceptual, which is what my drawing is set to. 
I could set this to uh, shades of gray. There we go. Still visible? Good. Okay. Uh, so we can use this uh, as at once the camera's placed, now we're actually looking through the camera and we can use this to establish our view. Uh, while this is on screen, you can see that my camera is still selected. There is a kind of a cone uh, that represents my field of view that's coming out of this camera. I can adjust the, uh, the cone or the field of view. Let me orbit this around a touch so we can see the grips a little bit better. There are some grips on these outer edges. Let me click this one that represents the width. And as I make this uh, cone larger or smaller, I'm adjusting my, my field of view or my zoom. Okay, this is how I can zoom in and out. If I click the grip on the camera itself, I can move the camera around the object. Okay, now the camera is staying at the elevation where I started, so using this, it's kind of like I can, uh, I can walk around. All right, uh, just based on what we see here, if you had a uh, outdoor rendering, if you were in a parking lot taking a picture of a building, you could place a target at eye level height, put your camera there, and then you could start moving around trying to uh, establish uh, an interesting view. I'm going to place this back to the uh, target where we started. Uh, there's one final grip here I can, I can click. This adjusts uh, target location. What, what am I looking at? I can use any object snap to adjust where I'm looking. If leave this back at the center. Um, in addition to editing the camera using grips, we can also edit it using the properties palette. Since my camera is selected, let me bring up my properties. I'm going to use the shortcut here, Control-1 to bring that up on screen. I'm also going to anchor this. I'm a big anchor guy with the palettes. Since I work in a one monitor system, uh, it's real nice to just right click on this name bar and choose uh, anchor left and just knock that down to a single icon on my screen. Let's stretch it out a little bit. I'll move this over a touch too. Uh, so now that my camera is selected, you can see some of the other options that we have here. I can give the camera a logical name. I can adjust the coordinates of the camera or the target. Uh, here's where I can adjust my lens length. Uh, if I'm trying to simulate a, uh, a picture taken with a 35 millimeter camera, I can take and set that here. Uh, real world application, I actually had to do something uh, similar uh, with, uh, with this setting. Uh, we sent an intern, I worked for a civil engineering firm. We sent an intern out to photograph an empty site. We were going to be putting a water tower there. He stood on the corner of the site, took some pictures with a 35 millimeter camera. We created the water tower in 3D, positioned ourselves in the same spot as where he was standing, and then uh, just set our camera to the 35 millimeter, did the renderings, and then we were able to incorporate those, and it, and it matched well in the, uh, in the original photograph. Okay, there's some other settings in here. Roll angle, I could uh, apply a little tilt to this if I want to. Okay, uh, when you're finished working with the camera view, uh, let me show you one more thing. There, there is a checkbox here that says display this window when editing a camera. If you were to uncheck that and then uh, close the window here, if we click the grip, you can see the, the, the or I'm sorry, the camera's uh, selected. Let me select it again. You see the preview doesn't come up. All right, how do we get the preview back? If the camera's selected and you right click, here's where you can bring the window back manually, view camera preview. Okay, and uh, if I hit escape as well to deselect this, it'll uh, close the window and uh, deselect the camera. All right, based on what we know now, let's create a second camera. I'm going to turn off my marker one layer here and I'll turn on marker two. This gives me a new set of targets. If I orbit this around, you can see I have a target above the objects. I also have a target uh, labeled B, which shows where my camera is going to be pointing. Uh, so let's place a camera in the drawing and we'll set this up for a rendering. I'll start by choosing Create Camera. I'll place this to the center of A. I'll point this to the center of B. I'm going to accept the defaults for right now. I will then uh, select the camera and we will let's turn the camera preview on and I will uh, check that box again. There we go. I'm going to go over to the Properties palette now, and I'll call this camera Overhead View. Uh, we'll simulate a uh, picture taken with a 35 millimeter camera. 
Perfect. And when I'm finished, I can hit uh, escape to close this up. I will uh, make sure the camera is deselected. Now, to render this, I need to position myself in space such that I'm looking through the camera. We need to apply the camera view to model space. Two ways to do that. If I select the camera, once it's in a selected state, I can right click and say, let me make sure that I'm uh, right clicking in the middle of the screen here. I can come down and choose set camera view. I am now looking through that camera. I'll hit escape to deselect. Another way to set a camera current, if you start accumulating cameras in the drawing, uh, we can come up to the in canvas menu. If I open this, I can go to custom model views and uh, here's my cameras right here. So I can flip to camera one, that's where we left off. Let me open this again and I'll go back to the overhead view. Okay, last thing, I'm going to turn marker two off such that that target doesn't show up in my rendering. And I'll click the render teapot and we'll, uh, we'll render this quickly and see what the uh, final image looks like. Now this model contains, it's already got materials applied. Um, it already has some light sources in it. So that stuff was taken care of for me. The, the only thing that I needed to do was, uh, was actually create, uh, create my 3D view. Uh, let me mention the machine that I'm using is a uh, uh, quad-core Windows 7 64-bit machine. I've got uh, 8 gig of RAM on it. So it's not a really high-end one, uh, but it does render fairly quick. And the nice thing about rendering, you can have an old machine and render. It just depends on how much time you want to spend on it. Um, so, you know, if you, have the, if you have the time, you set this guy to go overnight on, on the big renderings, and, uh, and then they're finished in the morning. So there's my image. Let me close this. So in this uh, session here, we, uh, a couple things we picked up. We learned how to position or insert and position a camera. We learned how to adjust that camera using grips or the properties palette. We also saw how we could uh, manipulate our view, assign that camera view to model space uh, such that we could create a rendering. Next thing I want to look at is creating a targeted light source. Um, Typically, it's, it's, it's really easy to, uh, when you're rendering something, to put in a point light. Point light is probably the easiest light source to drop in. It's a ball of light. You just put it in the drawing, and, and it casts light in all directions. Uh, you may not always want your light sources to cast light everywhere. You may want to create a light that, that uh, is focused in a particular area. Okay, that's what we're going to look at next. Let me jump back over to AutoCAD here. In this drawing, I've uh, got a model that represents a, a small desk lamp. Let me render this quickly. Now, I do have some light sources in this drawing. None of them are turned on right now. Uh, so when I render this, it's rendering the drawing using the, uh, the default lighting. Okay, I just want to show you what's in the file. What I'd like to do in, in this session is create a targeted light uh, to simulate the light coming from the desk lamp. Okay. Close this. Uh, placing lights uh, or targeted lights in the drawing is just like placing a camera. We're going to establish the source and then we're going to uh, point at a target. Okay? So to make that a little bit easier on myself, I'm going to open the layer manager here and I'll turn on a layer called marker one so I have some nice targets I can snap to. Uh, I'm also going to turn off this layer called uh, shade. This will hide the uh, the shade on the light make it a little easier to select these points. To place my targeted light, I'm going to come down to the lights panel and I'll open the create light menu and I'll select spot. Uh, spotlight acts just like, I mean the icon looks like a flashlight. It, it, it's a, like a, a floodlight or a flashlight. It creates a cone of light. So Let me choose that. Specify source location. I'm going to drop this at the node of A. And now, as I move it around, you can see the spotlight just wants to know where is it going to be pointing. I'll place this to node B. And a lot of settings. I can adjust all of these later. I'm just going to hit enter and accept what I have. Okay, you can see the result of the, uh, of the cone of light. 
Now, uh, if I want to edit this light source, just like a camera, I can select it and I can see the cone. I can also see some grips. There is a, a ring down here on the end. Uh, now the ring's going partially through the table. We can see some of the grips here. Uh, the grip on the outside represents fall off. If I click this, I can pull this out or push it in. Uh, you can see there's an angle measurement there as well. I'll pull this out to here. Uh, this adjusts the overall size of the cone of light. Okay. The inner grip represents the angle of my hot spot. I'll pull this in, make it a little bit smaller. I can also edit those values using numbers. Now, the farther your uh, fall off uh, is from your hot spot, if those things are separated enough, you'll have a nice soft edge on the spotlight. The closer those angles are together, then you start getting a sharp edge. Okay? Let me grip it at this. I'll pull it in a little bit further. We can also change the location of the spotlight using grips. Let me click the grip on the light here. And you can see wherever I place this in the drawing, it never loses sight of the target. Okay? I'll pull this back to uh, the node here of A. We can also edit spotlights using the Properties palette. Let me open up Properties. There's a few more settings here than what we have with a camera. Um, I can give this light a name. I'm going to call it a desk lamp for right now. Oops. It is a spotlight. Uh, interesting concept. I mean, we, it tells me it's a spotlight. I could change it to a different type of light if I wanted to. Okay, point light. Uh, and using in, in 2013, we have the instant preview. I'm seeing what this would look like as a point light. Let me just leave that at the uh, spotlight setting. Here's where I can turn the light source on and off. Uh, remember, I have some other lights in this drawing, and I said they were off. How do you turn them off? You just take and select them, and in the properties, you can take and turn them off that way. That was one thing we couldn't do back in the old days. If you did rendering back then, we had to create scenes uh, in order to turn things on and off, have light sources uh, not display. Uh, you can control where the lights, whether the lights have shadow, hot spot, fall off angle. Um, the lights in AutoCAD are photometric, so they will simulate real-world properties. Let me come down a little bit further here. I can see the intensity on this light is uh, 1,500 candelas. I'm going to knock that down a little bit. Let's make this uh, 300 candelas. And let me refer to my uh, sheet music here for some other numbers. Hotspot angle, let's try 47. I'll set the fall-off angle here to 52. Since those numbers are close together, I'll have a nice uh, sharp edge on this light. Okay. There are some additional settings in here. I'm going to do one more. Lamp color. I'm going to try and simulate an incandescent bulb. Okay. One of the, one of the nice things about the, the settings in, in AutoCAD, if you, uh, if you hover over these, you'll get a little more information. The, the best way to learn the settings is to, to change them. Render the model, see what it looks like. That is uh, honestly the best way to learn them. Okay. Uh, now that I've got my lamp set, I'm going to go ahead and hit Escape, and we'll render this again and take a look at the difference. Since I am using a targeted light, I am only seeing where that light is aiming. The rest of the model is black. If you've ever rendered something and your, your screen was black, chances are that's your, your light was pointing, wasn't aiming at your object. Okay. Uh, you can see there's a, I'm not sure how well it shows up there, there's a, a glossy finish on my lamp, so you can see a little reflection. But other than that, the only light that we see is the light coming from the uh, spotlight. Let's close this. And I'm going to turn the uh, lampshade layer back on. There we go. Let me show you one more thing. I'm going to orbit the view around. You would think that if we rendered this light from here, we would see a great big bright light uh, up in the uh, lampshade itself. If I render this, you will see that we don't. You will never see the light source in AutoCAD. You will only see the result of the light. Uh, knowing that we can put light sources anywhere, uh, we will only ever see what they illuminate, Okay, which is a nice thing. Uh, I'm going to take into, at this point, we'll, we'll restore our previous view. 
To do that, I'll open the in-canvas menu here, custom model views, I'll select final. And I'm going to turn off that marker layer. I don't need that anymore. Uh, lastly, now that I've set my view, I'm going to destroy that. Let me back up here a little bit. Notice I have some other point lights in this drawing. Right now they are they're turned off. Okay. To turn the lights on, I can select the light, come over to properties, and I can change its on-off status. Okay, no problem. I have three of them though. You may have more than that. Okay, depending on how you illuminate your scene, you could have 18 lights. Let me show you a quicker way. I'm going to hit escape. On the lights panel, there is a small arrow in the lower right corner. Anytime you see an arrow like this in the ribbon, it represents there's a dialog box associated with those settings. If I open this, it brings up the light list palette, showing me all of the lights in this file. If you select the light in this list, it selects it in the model. If I hold my shift key and select all of these point lights, it'll select all of them, okay, even if they're not visible on screen. Now that they're selected, let me go to properties. I'll change their on off status to on. There we go. We'll uh, move away and, uh, oh, let me anchor that. I'm wondering why it's not collapsing. I haven't anchored it. There we go. Let me restore my previous view, and we'll render this a final time. So if you do use targeted light sources, you will probably have to have some other light um, to, to take and, and give you some additional illumination in the, in the drawing. Okay. So based on uh, what we saw in that session, we, we looked at how we could create a targeted light. Very similar to a camera. Pick your target, aim it at where you want to, aim it at what you want to illuminate. And we also saw it could be edited with the properties palette or grips, just like we can with a camera. And we saw the light list palette. You can access that by typing light list or by using the little arrow on the lights panel. This gives us a, it's a one-stop shop to access all of the light sources in your model. Okay. Next, I'd like to talk about bump maps. Mentioned a little earlier, this is probably the most important way to uh, increase realism in your renderings. Uh, by adding a bump map, I can uh, give my material uh, texture or relief. Okay. Let me jump back over to AutoCAD. And you can already see I have a camera set up in this drawing. Let me zoom out a little bit. All I have in this file is a, a flat region, okay? And I have a solid cylinder. What I'd like to do, the, uh, the goal in this uh, lesson, is, is to make this cylinder look like a Kennedy half dollar. Now, if I tried to model that, that would be extremely difficult. It would create a lot of um, uh, faces on my object, take a long time to render. I don't have to do any of that detail, I can get all of it using bump maps. Okay. What I'm going to do first, uh, since I don't have any materials in this file, uh, I'm going to create a material that, uh, that represents the, uh, the coin. Okay, it'll be a shiny metallic material. So I'll start by bringing up the materials browser. In 2013, the, the default appearance of the browser has changed. Used to be we had nice big thumbnails. Now it's more of a streamlined approach. Nothing wrong with this. Um, it, it allows us to see more materials at one time. Uh, personal preference for myself, I do like to see the large uh, icons. If you want to go back to a more, uh, I say classic, I'm just talking about last year. If you want to go back to the last year's version, uh, there are some icons right here. This one controls the appearance of the materials in the drawing. It's kind of like the, uh, the details uh, or the list button in your Windows Explorer. I'm going to change this to thumbnail view. I'll pull this down a little bit. I'll click the same icon here and I'll change this one to thumbnail view. I will also click to open up the library. So you can see I have a material in the file already. We'll, we'll uh, insert that one in a little bit. I'd like to, uh, for my coin material, I'd like to create a, a brand new material. 
To create a new material in 2013, you're going to come to the bottom of the palette. And uh, there are several uh, templates that we can use if we want to create you know, material that's based on concrete or paint or something like that. Uh, I'm just going to come down and choose new generic material. This allows me to create a material where I have access to the, the majority of the settings. Okay, I can, I can pretty much do what I want here. I'm going to call my material coin. Okay, at this point, I can uh, come down. You can see there are several uh, expandable categories here that control all of the settings that can be adjusted for this material. Um, if a category is being used, you'll see the check. If I, if I put a check in the category, it means the settings in that category are being used. Okay, Makes it nice if everything's in a collapsed state, uh, you can tell where you have to go to, to make changes. I'm going to turn off the reflectivity there for a second. And uh, to build my material, I'm going to start by adjusting its color. I'll click the color swatch here, and I'll drag it up to 255, 255, 255, or white. Uh, I'd like this to be glossy. I'm going to adjust the glossiness here up to 61. There's no magic to that number. I just, I've been rendering this a few times, and 61 works out well. Uh, a little easier than going through all the iterations here. Okay, and uh, highlights, I'm going to set that to metallic. Uh, you'll find that uh, many of the settings in this list are uh, kind of self-explanatory. Uh, like anything else, though, uh, if you have a question about a setting, we can take and hover over it and get more information. Um, you can see it doesn't look like it's very metallic just yet. I'm going to come down and, and apply some reflectivity. We'll change the uh, direct setting here to 40. Uh, your direct reflectivity is, is how um, reflective your material is if the surface is, if, if you're perpendicular to that surface, how reflective is it? And then oblique, how reflective is that surface if it is uh, at an angle to you? Uh, I don't want it to be that reflected. I'm, I'm just going to drag this oblique down to zero. Okay, for right now, this is perfect. Let me close the materials editor. I can now see my custom materials in the drawing. If I want to apply this to my cylinder, we can do that using drag and drop. I'll click, hold, and drag, and I only want to place this on the top of the cylinder. Uh, so I'm going to hold my control key. I will then release my mouse button. If you hold the control key, it restricts the insertion of the material to a single face only. This way you don't have to apply it to the entire object. Okay. Now, it still doesn't look much like a coin. Uh, it's, it's basically a, a shiny material. It's still smooth. Let's apply a bump map to it now. Okay, to, uh, to apply the bump map, I'm going to edit the material that I just made. To edit the material, we can, in 2013, there's a new icon here we can click. Uh, likewise, the old-fashioned way, if you double-click on a material, it'll bring it back up in the editor. What I'm going to do is come down to the bump properties. I'll expand those. And I'm going to insert or, or apply a bump map image. A bump map is nothing more than a, a black and white photograph. Uh, anything that is brightly colored or white will come towards you. Anything that is dark or, or black will take and recede. Okay? By applying this, this is how we give the material texture. To insert the image, let me check that I want to use the bump map properties. It knows I want to insert an image, so now I can uh, navigate to this on my hard drive. There we go. I'm going to select this image called uh, Kennedy B Map. I'll click open. And uh, if you hover over the small preview here, you can see a larger one. So this will give you an idea of what, uh, what I'm adding. Uh, generally speaking, the head's going to be coming towards me, uh, as is the text. Uh, anything that's, that's black there is going to recede. So it should be raised. Uh, now, uh, what I'd like to do, when you're dealing with a material that you create that is image-based, uh, very important that your material be defined at the size uh, of the actual object that you're mapping it to. Okay? This cylinder in the drawing has a diameter of 1.205. That is the, the diameter of a, a Kennedy half dollar. Uh, how do I know that? Wikipedia. Okay? Just took and made the object the same size. 
So I'm going to set this image to have the same size. That way it'll, it'll, uh, it'll fit perfectly. Uh, to edit the image, I will uh, click on this uh, image swatch. I'll pull this over a little bit. And here's where I can, uh, this brings up my texture editor, uh, where I can edit the properties of this image. I'm just going to drag this down. Uh, scale represents the size. There's an aspect ratio button here. You know, if I, it, it's locked right now. So as I change one of these numbers, the other one is going to stay proportional. So let's change this to uh, 1.205. Now remember, the material is already mapped to the object. So as, as soon as I hit tab to accept that value, you can kind of maybe see that bump map starting to show up here. Let's uh, close this and we'll take a look. Uh, bump map's kind of showing up. Now that the, the uh, image has been applied, if I come down here, I can adjust this amount slider. Okay, the more I increase it, the, the, the bumpier it gets. Right now I'm up to 567, which is a little extreme. Uh, if you drag this down below zero, now you're inverting your bump map. Now it's going the other way. It's pushing it down. Okay. I'm going to set this uh, to have an amount of uh, 83 for right now. We'll accept that value. I'll close this and we'll restore our previous view. And let's render this. Okay, so, so just by adding that image, I can now, uh, I've got a lot more detail on this object, and really it's just a solid sim uh, cylinder. Okay? Now let's, uh, let's increase the, uh, the, the realism of the, of the, uh, the top of the coin. Uh, it's raised now. Uh, what I'd like to do next is, is map a photograph on top of the bump map. This will give me additional detail that I don't get just by raising and lowering the material. So we'll close this, and I'm going to edit my coin material. Let me click the Edit button. To add an image to this, I'm going to come up to the generic setting. This is where we change the color to white. I'll click in the image property here, and I will choose this image called Kennedy.jpg. Now there is no difference between this image and the other one. They are identical except for shading. Okay. I, I grabbed an image uh, online, um, and I just through Photoshop I changed the uh, shading so I could use one for a bump map and one for the uh, the photograph. So this kind of has a more metallic uh, property to it. Okay. Uh, note, uh, AutoCAD does have a difficult time when you've got both of these things you know going in at the same time, so we can't see it just yet. Uh, the important thing is when I add this image, I want to make sure I put it in at the right size, just like before. It's 12 by 12 right now. Let me drag this down, and we'll change this to 1.205, same size as the, the top of the coin. Okay, now, now it shows up. It's registered, you know, same location. There are some other settings here. Uh, we could tile the material. You can see some of that here. Uh, tiling's nice. If the material, uh, you know, like if you were doing like a wood, uh, wood grain, and, uh, and you, you made the image smaller, you'd want it tiled so that you have uh, additional image filling in the gaps. I don't need that here. In fact, it, it doesn't show up anyway, so uh, I'm just going to leave that set to tile. Using these position settings, this is where we can we could tweak the registration. I can use the X and Y offsets to, to you know, dial this up exactly where I want it. I can rotate it if I wanted to. One of the most important settings in here is the Link Texture Transforms button. Chances are you'll want to check that. Uh, what that means is uh, from the images perspective, checking that box means if I change any other materials associated or any other images associated with this material will scale proportionally. That way they'll stay together. You don't resize the, the image and then the bump map stays the way it was. Okay, this, this keeps them together. All right, uh, and we can, we can test that now that this is checked. If I turn off the aspect ratio here, let me change the, uh, the width of this image now to 3. And when I do, watch the, uh, you'll see the properties over here. Let me change this to 3. I'll hit tab. Notice how the other one changed as well. Okay, so if I change, change everybody. Now, while that does have an interesting look, let me change that back to 1.205. Let me close this. We'll close this. We'll render it one more time.
One of the nice things about the render window is we do have the ability to go back and look at prior versions. So you can start saying better one, better two. Okay. Next thing I'd like to do is uh, I'd like to apply the, uh, the ridges. They're actually called reeds, Wikipedia. Okay. 150 of them around the outside. Um, now I could take and I could create little cylinders and array those around, union everything together to create the ridges, but once again I'm increasing the number of uh, polygons on my shape. Uh, I can get away with the same thing just by doing a bump map around the edge. So uh, I'd like to create a new material uh, to do the bump map around the edge of this coin. Uh, it's going to have the same physical properties as the top, just a different image. So rather than going through and adjusting reflectivity and color and all that stuff, I'm going to take this coin material that I already have. I'll right click on that and I'll choose duplicate. I'll call this one uh, coin edge. I will then click the edit button to bring that material up in the, uh, in the materials editor. Now I don't need the uh, image anymore. To, uh, to drop the image I can open the menu over here and select remove. That's gone. Uh, I would like this material to have a bump map, although I don't want to use the Kennedy image. So let's click on the, uh, the image sample here. And all I have to do is change the source. Let me come over here and I'll click the hyperlink. And I'm going to use this uh, bump map called uh, Coin Edge. Basically, what I did in Photoshop, I, I created a, uh, a photograph that had the same circumference it was width, it's a, it's a rectangle, had the same width as the circumference of the coin, and then I created enough little black and white lines to represent uh, 150 raised areas. Okay? So that's what we're grabbing here. There it is. Now, uh, once again, wrong size. When we create an image-based material, we want it to be the same size as what we're mapping it to. So I'm going to come down to scale here. And um, my height is going to be uh, 0 0.085. That's the thickness of the coin. The width. At this point, you, you might think the width would be the circumference. I know I always did. Um, there is a, a caveat. When you map a material cylindrically, the width will always be 1. It's, it's, a, uh, it's, it's kind of like a, well, it's called scale right here. It's kind of a scale thing. 1 for the width represents 100%. Okay, the height's going to be real-world thinking, but the width will always be one. That way the, uh, the image wraps essentially uh, one time around the object. Knowing that, if we, uh, if we set that to, to uh, 0 0.5, we'd get two images going around. Okay, so there's my material. Let me close this. I'll close this. Now to map the material to the side, we'll drag coin edge over here. I'll hold my control key and I'll release over the edge of the coin. Now it, it looks a little denser than 150. Another caveat, if you apply a material to a cylindrical object, it never goes on perfectly the first time. Okay? Um, we just have to take, we have to adjust the material mapping. Has anybody had to tweak the material mapping at all? We'll, we'll do a significant, uh, fantastic. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll be talking about that in the, in the session tomorrow if, if you're interested. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that a lot. Let's, uh, let's get into it enough here to fix our, our issue. So I can see that this is, this is uh, mapped around the outside. There is a menu here in the, uh, in the materials panel called material mapping. This is how I can control how the material is applied to the object. You just pick the basic shape. What are you working with? I'm working with a cylinder. So I want to adjust the cylindrical mapping. OK. Select faces. I'm going to hold my control key and click this edge. That's the face I want to change and I'll press enter. Okay, that's it. That's really all you have to do. Once you do that, then the thing, the AutoCAD's like, okay, perfect, that's 0 .085 tall, one time around. So I don't want to make any other changes, I'm just going to go ahead and hit enter and accept that. All right, let's, um, uh, before we render this uh, one final time, let's, let's go ahead and I'll take this material that we saw earlier. This is a uh, the three inch square terracotta. I'm going to drag this out and drop it over the, the region that represents the floor. Now this material comes stock with AutoCAD. It has uh, some bump map applied to it already. 
And we can see that just, you know, for a little repetition here. Let me go to edit to bring up the materials editor. And you can see uh, this is an image-based material, just like the, uh, the top of the, the half dollar. Now, this one was based on a template, so it doesn't have all the settings that we, we saw with a generic material. Uh, notice there's an option here called Relief Pattern. There's our image, and there's our amount. In many cases, you can take, uh, all this person did, they took their camera and, and photographed uh, four tiles, okay? Then they took that same image, converted it to black and white, and then they just made sure that the grout lines were the darker color. You map them both on the same material, and now the grout lines will be recessed. Okay, it'll have that, uh, that type of texture. That's, that's really all there is to it. Let me close this. I'm going to restore my camera. So we'll go back to the menu here, custom model views, final, and we'll render this again. This time as it goes through, you'll, uh, if you look at the tile floor, you'll see, like I said, the grout's kind of dipped down. The image has a, uh, a little bit of a resolution to it, so the grout kind of looks gritty. Um, usually the, the, the first time you render in AutoCAD, it'll come up if it's a fresh install. Uh, it'll come up and ask you if you want to load the um, uh, medium image library. By default, it doesn't contain the, the high-resolution images. Uh, so you will want to take and, and download those. It's a 700 meg download, but uh, once you download it, the, then you'll be producing the best images, uh, best renderings that are possible. Okay, so essentially two objects, and we've got a uh, fairly realistic looking uh, image there. Once again, I can't see that screen. It looks great on this screen. Okay, let me close this. So based on what we looked at in that session, um, we talked about uh, applying bump maps. A bump map is a black and white image. All right. Lighter areas are raised, darker areas are lowered. It makes a huge difference in the texture of your renderings. We can see uh, the exact same rendering two different ways. On the left, without bump maps, and on the right, we have them. We saw that we can edit the bump map intensity. And uh, we also saw that materials can have uh, multiple images assigned to them. And we can link them together using that link texture uh, checkbox. That way if one changes, they change proportionally. This rendering was created from AutoCAD. Uh, when I was preparing for this class, I was doing a little experimentation with the bump maps. Um, I produced this just to play around, showed it to some people and, and said, hey, I rendered this in AutoCAD, and they said, no, no. Uh, AutoCAD's really not looked at as being a tool that can create uh, organic shapes. Um, with the mesh modeling uh, with, the, with the mesh objects that came out in 2011, uh, we can model and render just about anything, okay? So what I'd like to do in, in this session, uh, we'll, we'll take and recreate this drawing real quick. This is really no more complicated than the coin. It's two objects, really. Three if you include the stem. Um, but uh, this, this will give us an opportunity to look at uh, bump maps a little bit more, and it'll get into our next topic, which is uh, clipping materials using cutouts. Okay. Let me jump back over to AutoCAD here, and I'll close this. Okay, let me back up a little bit. Once again, I've got my, uh, my blue region here for my table, and I do have a camera in the drawing. Uh, what I'd like to do first is uh, let's, let's make this... Uh, it's, it's a floor. We'll, we'll make it look like a wood deck, okay? Uh, all I did was went out on my back deck, took my camera, pointed straight down, made sure my feet were out of the way, and I, and I took a picture of my, uh, my deck, all right? So I'm going to create a material that's based on that image. I'm going to start by choosing new generic material. Call this wood deck, and... Uh, color really doesn't matter. I'm going to use an image at this point. If, as soon as you use the image, the color goes out the window. It's not uh, applied. So let me click image. Uh, let me mention before I select this, the, this panel that I have in the, in the drawing here, this region, measures 18 inches wide by 12 inches uh, deep. Okay. I'll select this image called deck. Okay, there's the photo that I took. 
I'd like to map this at the appropriate size, so let's assign the uh, real world size to this. I'm going to come down and uh, I'll uncheck the aspect ratio here. We'll make the sample size here 18 by 12. And uh, we'll go ahead and link texture transforms in the event something, you know, I do more with this. Uh, my, all of my images will stay proportional. I will then close this. Let's, uh, we'll close the materials editor for just a second, and then we'll drag this wood deck material out onto the panel. Let's restore the camera. I'm going to do that by selecting the camera this time. I'll right click and choose set camera view. And let's just do a, uh, we'll just do a quick rendering here. Now, it, it doesn't look too bad. You know, I'm, uh, I'm looking at the wood deck. It, 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 see in the photograph, it is still smooth, doesn't have a, a lot of relief. What I'd like to do now is, is add the bump map, okay? I'm going to use the exact same image, just a black and white version. So we'll come back here and we'll click the edit button to go into the editor. We'll pop down here and we'll select that we want to use the bump settings. And I'll choose this one called deck B map. Just like before, here's an interesting thing. Now, when it gets dropped into the drawing, it it kind of looks like it registers perfectly. It doesn't. You still have to go over here and set the size the way it's supposed to be. Okay? Don't, uh, don't let the, uh, the realistic view fool you. So let's, let's set this to the appropriate size. Uh, I'm going to uncheck the aspect ratio, and I'll change this to 18 by 12. You want to set these sizes before you check this box. Okay? Make sure the size is good before you, before you link it. So we'll link that as well. I'll close this. And um, once again, I'm going to refer to my, uh, my sheet music here, make sure that I, I put the, uh, the appropriate height in. Let's go with uh, 73 for the amount. There we go. Kind of has a little bit of an offset look there. We'll render it again. Okay, at this point, uh, you can see the wood grain, you can see the, uh, you can see the indentation in the uh, screw heads here. As I jump back and forth between smooth, gritty. Okay, so now I've got my material for the deck. That's good to go. I'll close this and uh, let's zoom out a little. Um, I'm going to take and work on the leaf now. Uh, before I do that, let's... Uh, I'm going I'm to select this region real quick here, and I'll come over to Properties. I'm going to assign a different material to this temporarily, just to make future renderings a little quicker. Let's use the Properties palette, and I'm going to apply the uh, global material to this again. So now it goes back to blue. We can always uh, flip it back later, uh, but this way when I render the leaf, I don't have to wait for the extra overhead of the, the bump map on the deck. So I'm going to go to the Layer Manager here. And I will bring up the, we'll turn on this layer called Leaf. What I have here is a mesh object. Okay, even though it says region, it's looking through it. The table's a region. All right, uh, so I've got a, a mesh object here. This was created, um, if, if you've ever made a mesh before, it's, it's a lot like creating a, um, a solid or a surface. There are primitives. Okay, if you, if you go to the Mesh tab, there, there's primitives here. Okay, what I did, I created a mesh box, all right, created a mesh box, and then I held my control key, because I only wanted the bottom face. I held my control key, and I windowed all of the mesh that was above the bottom face and deleted it. So that's what I have left, it's just the bottom of that box, okay. Uh, I also uh, applied a smoothing factor to this. In fact, if, since it's selected, if I come over here to Properties, you can see it's got a smoothing level of 4, so it's kind of uh, soft. One nice thing about the, the mesh, let me select this again. Um, you can see it's kind of got a, some bumpy properties. That's because I've, I've already mapped the, uh, the leaf onto this uh, once already, and I kind of took and started pulling things up to give the leaf a natural, leaves aren't flat, you know. Uh, so I started pulling uh, things up to make it look a little more realistic. Since this is a mesh, uh, the way this works, if, if, if you hold your control key and click on a face 
or an edge or a vertice. You can select that uh, particular object. I can then uh, hover and, and click on this gizmo and, and you can start distorting this uh, to whatever shape you want. Okay, so, so that's what I did. That's, that's how we got the little bumps in there. What I'd like to do is create a, a leaf material now and, and map it onto this object. So what we'll do is create a new material here, new generic material. We'll call this uh, leaf. It's going to be image-based. So I'll click the image property and we'll go and grab a photograph. Wow, that was loud. <laughs> uh, I'm going to use this one called red maple. Uh, this leaf was uh, created by uh, pulling a leaf off the neighbor's tree, and then I just put it on my scanner. Okay, didn't have to photograph this. That's the actual image I got from the scanner. Uh, that being said, um, my original intention for this wasn't uh, uh, to use it for a, uh, the presentation, so my image size is going to be a little bit uh, specific, like to three or four decimal spaces. All right, I didn't uh, didn't use. Uh, I, I just said, you know what? This is my image size, so I drew a. The, the bottom of my box has the same size as my image. That way I could just map it right on there and it would fit perfectly. So this image, let me uncheck the aspect ratio here. This image is going to have a width of 6.1459. Like I said, highly accurate. And it will have a, a height of 4.9542. There we go. Let me close this. Oh, let me, uh, we'll do link texture transforms. We'll take care of that. Uh, as long as we're in here, we'll take care of the bump map as well. So we'll come down here and we'll apply the bump property. I'm going to select this image called uh, Red Maple B Map. Exact same photo, just a black and white version. Uh, I set this so that the, um, uh, the veins would be a lighter color so that they would raise up. Uh, notice if I go to the, yeah, I am at the top here. Notice there's an invert image. This is a nice touch if, if you are dealing with a black and white image and it is opposite of what you need, you can click this invert image button to take and flip that. You don't have to use Photoshop for everything. Just like before, we'll set our size. Let me turn off the aspect ratio here and we will put in those uh, very specific numbers again. A width of 6.1459 and a height of 4.9542. There we go. We'll close this. And um, let's go ahead and map this to the object now. We'll take care of the amount in a second. I'll close this. To uh, apply this, I will drag it over and drop it over the mesh. Now it doesn't drop exactly where it's supposed to, so we're going to use the material mapping again. Last time we looked at cylindrical, this time we're going to use a different option. Let me go back to the render tab. So once the material's on the object, I will, uh, I apologize, I'll open the material mapping menu here and I'll choose planar. Now if I hover over that it says uh, projects an image onto a flat surface. Not necessarily true, this isn't flat, it is raised. Uh, think of planar mapping as being like the uh, projector. I mean, it's projecting the image is what it's doing. So even if it's kind of bumped out a little bit, it's just going to distort the image a little bit in those areas. So I'll choose planar. I'll click the mesh and I'll press enter. This will register the image to one of the corners. Okay, that's really all I have to do right here. There are other gizmos where I could try take and rotate this, but it's it's perfectly lined up in the corner. I'm just going to hit enter to accept that. All I have to do is rotate this image 90 degrees. The easiest way to do that is just, just go into the editor. We can, we can apply a rotation right there. So let me come in here and we'll choose edit. And uh, I can edit either image. They're both tied together. So we'll click this image and because I checked link texture transforms, if this guy changes, his counterpart will change as well. Perfect. Let's take care of the, uh, the amount, too. By default, this is 30. Uh, I'm going to bump this up to 245. Let's 
close this. I will reload the uh, camera view again, and we'll render this. So at this point, we can we can see the uh, the leaf. It has texture. Uh, it's it's kind of raised. You can see how that mesh causes the leaf to to, to be distorted slightly, to look a little more natural. Uh, what I have to do now is is trim this. Okay, I can trim this material using another image. I'm going to use the same leaf image. Okay, it's it's going to be the exact same uh, uh, workflow. I'll use a photograph to to clip out this white area. Let me go back into the editor. And uh, this time we'll look at cutouts. Let me check that I want to use that property. Uh, cutout is just going to be an image. I'll select this image, red maple cutout. Once again, it's, it's the exact same photograph, except this time it's all black or all white. White areas are kept, black areas are trimmed out. Okay? Just like we saw before, as soon as I pick this, it, man, it looks, the, the computer's like, oh, I know exactly how to register this for you. you by the realistic view, you would swear that's going to work perfectly. In fact, let's, let's assume that. Let me click render. Not exactly what we thought it was going to be. Okay, sometimes the realistic view can lie to us. All right. What do I have to do? I have to go into the material and I just have to set the size properties to the same as uh, the other two images. Let me go back to the editor here. I'll click the cutout. And this will be the last time we have to edit or uh, enter those really specific numbers. Six points. 1459 and a height of 4.9542. Um, I also want to rotate this 90 because the other two are rotated 90. There we go. And let's say link texture transforms. That way, if I ever change this one, it'll change the other two as well. Finally, I'll close this. Uh, we'll close the material. That should be good. The, the, um, the last object that I have in here, let me take this uh, layer here. I'll turn this on. I'm going to turn on this layer called stem. This is a mesh object. Okay, it's, uh, although it doesn't look like it now, it was created using a mesh primitive, a cylinder. Okay, using mesh, you create the primitive, and then you start grabbing objects, and you start stretching them and pulling them. Okay, just like Play-Doh. I just pulled that out, skewed it a little bit so it looked a little more organic. So there's my stem. Uh, we'll put the wood deck material, which is, still remembers the bump map. I'll, I'll take and drop that back on the deck. Let's do a regen here. Perfect. We'll reload our camera view, and we'll render this again. All right. So uh, in this lesson, we got an opportunity to go a little bit deeper into the bump map. The biggest thing we saw here was the cutout uh, property. Using the cutout, we can take a black and white image and use it to trim our materials to uh, any shape that we want. Now, when would you use uh, something like this? A practical example? People. If you're doing an uh, architectural rendering and you want people outside the building. You can take and create a, a vertical plane, map a photo of a person on it, put a cutout image over the top that represents the area of the person you want to keep, and the people have a nice, nice boundary. They use it for uh, landscape objects, same principle. Picture of a tree, put a cutout image that clips out the, uh, the area of the tree that you don't want to see. Um, let me take... Here's a rendering of a, a soft drink bottle. Now that I can see the saturation is uh, horrible on the uh, screen there. Uh, this label uh, was created using cutouts. Okay, I'm mapping it on a, on a clear glass bottle. Um, so what did I do? I created a material that represented the photograph. It was actually the, uh, the Frosty logo two times because I wanted to wrap it around the outside and have it on the front and the back. You can see it there through the glass on the back side. I then applied a cutout to it and said trim off everything except for the, the uh, text. Uh, we can also see in the, in the top of the little detail image there, you can see a bump map that kind of pulls the glass out. 
Okay. Now let me mention uh, one more thing here. If you've ever had to render um, glass, especially glass that has something inside it, when you use the default settings, horrible. It comes up black almost all the time. Uh, sometimes you have to look at the objects that you're making um, and, and don't look at them as being uh, like you have to create the real object in the drawing. This bottle, for instance, uh, although it looks like a, a glass bottle full of um, the blue cream soda, the, the only part of this bottle that's glass is just this little piece of the top. Everything from this edge down is just one big solid mass that's applied the, uh, the, uh, the transparent, refractive, uh, light blue color. Because if you look at a glass bottle, you can't see the thickness of the glass in this area anyway. Okay? If you do that, uh, it makes it much easier to, to take and render something like this. Actually, the, the area along the bottom there, too, is a, is a little sliver of glass. Because at the bottom of the bottle, you could see the thickness of the glass. So I just created a little piece around the bottom. And that created some nice uh, highlights coming up through the bottom there. Okay, the uh, grabbed a uh, image online. It's a uh, hockey rink. Uh, wanted to give it a bump map. Just made it black and white. That way, little of the grooves took in, you know, gave it a little bit of texture. So bump maps and uh, bump maps and cutouts. Okay, let's. Uh, Let's talk for a second here about uh, working more efficiently with larger renderings. Like I said before, rendering is an iterative process. I have been known to render things hundreds of times because I'm a very picky person. Okay? I, I, I just can't stop. Let me show you how we can render things a little bit quicker. I'm going to open a drawing here called Large Rendering. Uh, this is an image of, uh, or a, a model that represents a, a workstation, you know, some uh, desk chairs and a table. I've got some uh, cabinets in the back. I have to admit, I didn't draw all of this. Great source for free 3D stuff. If, uh, if you go to Autodesk Seek, uh, if you just type Seek at the command line, you can bring up Autodesk Seek and you can download a lot of free uh, uh, three-dimensional content to play around with. Don't, uh, don't reinvent the wheel. Get as much as you can for free. So this drawing uh, takes approximately 20 minutes to render, OK? Uh, because it, on the Render tab here, uh, you can see that the uh, preset that I'm using is called Jeff Presentation. If I open this up, uh, stock with AutoCAD, we have uh, several presets, uh, you know, draft up through presentation. Even if we get all the way up to presentation, we're still not utilizing all of the settings that are possible. Uh, so what I did, I came down to manage render presets here. This is where you can go a little bit farther than what you get uh, right out of the box. Uh, as an example here, um, I see a list of my presets on the left. And on the right here, we can see all of the uh, settings that are being applied. A little light bulb represents that that category is being used. If I come down to presentation, which is, like I said, as high as you go, you can see that uh, some of these are not uh, turned on. Okay, ray tracing, uh, global illumination. All right. Once again, hover. It'll, it'll give you a rough example of what they do. Uh, indirect illumination, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, yeah, global illumination. This is a nice one. Um, it will, it'll uh, increase the uh, brightness of your model. Because what it does, if this is turned on, any light that strikes an object that bounces off, that light that bounces off will contribute to the illumination. Okay, gives you a much uh, nicer, um, much more realistic uh, quality to the rendering. Uh, for instance, if you render this, I did rendered it with without global illumination. The area underneath the desk is really dark. Okay, so what I did, uh, I took and uh, selected presentation here, and I chose create copy. I created the copies down here. I took and renamed it then Jeff Presentation, and I went through and started turning these settings on, and I was adjusting values. Okay, creates a much more realistic rendering. Takes a lot longer to render. Okay, so I've got a big model. Takes a long time to render. So how can we uh, start making evaluations on this without waiting 20 minutes each time? Okay, uh, normally. To render quickly, you would pick a lower preset. Uh, 
on the downside here, if I pick the lower preset, I don't get my global illumination, so my light is wrong. Okay, I have to, to render this uh, using the, uh, the presentation version. First thing I'm going to do to, uh, to render this quick is the resolution. If I open the render panel here, I can come down. Uh, we can see that uh, the intent for this is to render at 1,500 pixels wide uh, by 937 tall. Let me open this up. I can pick a preset resolution, or I can come down and choose specify image size. So uh, we can see that my uh, image aspect or the ratio between these is 1.6. We'll make that nice and even, and I'll lock that. So this is my uh, image aspect. This is what I want to keep. I just want to render a smaller version. So now that I've locked my image aspect, I can change my width down to uh, maybe 150 pixels, one-tenth its size. I'll click OK, and then I'll click Render. And in the render window now, it's going to render a much smaller image, but it will render a lot faster. And even at this size, uh, I can determine the intensity of my lights. I can also tell the, uh, the density of some of my materials. Okay, so uh, I got a rendering there. If we look down at the bottom, I got a rendering there in 12 seconds, which is not too bad to do some evaluations. Um, looking at this now, uh, I, I may evaluate. You know what? Uh, the, the the floor color, uh, the the background is a little bit too light. I'd like the the furniture to stand out a little bit more. So I'm going to make a quick change here. Let's bring up the materials browser. We'll edit this floor material real quick. I'll just click the edit button. And I will change the color of this from 243s to uh, 170s. I'll just go ahead and type in the RGB value. Since the numbers are all equal, it'll be a nice uh, darker shade of gray. OK. In the interest of saving some time, I'm not going to render that again small. We'll, uh, we'll assume that uh, the second one looks a lot better. Uh, let's take and make another adjustment, or another, another way, another tip for rendering these things faster. If I expand the panel, uh, we have the option here of reducing the render quality. By default, this is set to 2. We can go all the way up to 5. All right, the higher you go, the, the, the nicer your images are going to look. Uh, I'm going to drag this down to 0. This really goes a long way towards letting you render quickly. In fact, so much so, I'm going to drag this down. I'm even going to increase the resolution a little bit. Let me go to image size and uh, had a little problem, a little rounding error there. Let's set that back to 1.6. I'll change the width here to uh, 640 pixels wide. So that'll be a nice 640 by 400 image at uh, zero for render quality. We'll click render again. Having the render quality set way down to zero removes some of the anti-aliasing in the image. But still, looking at this, I, now I, I can still evaluate uh, material colors, darkness, lightness. Okay, now, as this comes around, you know, let's say we're doing this image for an IKEA catalog. Okay. Uh, and uh, looking at this, you know, the uh, chairs, we're starting to lose the chairs there next to the uh, cabinetry. They're the same color. All right, I'd like to maybe darken those up, maybe make them red. Okay, we'll, we'll change the, the, the chair color. Fortunately, like I said, these I didn't draw these. I got them off Seek. For that reason, there are a lot of layers uh, for all the little parts. They do a nice job organizing everything, but uh, it's, it's a lot of layers. So I don't want to drag these materials on because there's many little pieces. Uh, in AutoCAD, we can apply materials based on layer just like you can apply a color or a line type. If I open the Materials panel, there's a button here called Attach by Layer. On the left, I see a listing of all of the materials that are in the file. And on the right, over here, I can see a listing of my layers, and I can see the materials that have been assigned to those layers. The red X's can be used to remove those materials. So what I'm going to do I'll take this arm pad layer, which is right now set to uh, ice white. I'll drag my, my material called red over here, and I'll drop that on the arm pad. Uh, there are two other layers that have to do with this chair. The, uh, the seat back seat back, and the, the seat are both applied linen white. 
I've already got one here created called Linen Red. All right. What did I do? I dragged the linen white material into the uh, drawing, and then I just went in and modified the color. When I'm finished here, I'll click OK. You can see that my chairs are now red. We'll, uh, we'll render that out one more time. Okay, so I'm still uh, I'm beating the 20 minute time frame. I can now look at this and, and determine if I like the uh, if I like the color. The uh, the white lumbar support is a little racy, but uh, ah, you know I'd sit on it. Uh, as I as I look at this now, I, I'm going to make one more uh, adjustment here. There's a pedestal underneath the desk. Um, it's all white. Maybe I'd like to incorporate some of this wood grain on the front of this pedestal. Uh, I'm going to go back to that layer thing. We'll just assign the wood material to the layer that represents the front of those drawers. So we'll go right back in here to attach by layer. And I'll come down to the pedestal layers. Pedestal drawer right here. And we'll take the cherry material. I'll drag that over and I'll drop it on the drawer. And I'll click OK. Uh, let's look at one other shortcut that we have. So not only can we render it small, we can render the quality down. Uh, we can also render just a, a small area on screen. We don't have to render the entire image each time. If I open the render menu, there's an option here called render region. I'll click this. I will then uh, click two points to define a rectangle. And AutoCAD will render only that area right on screen. So doing this, you know, if you put a light source in the drawing and you're wondering if it's too hot, Sometimes you can just render a small piece and maybe that's all you need to see. Okay? I've got a weird glow on this object. I just adjusted my light. Do I have to render the whole thing? No, just render the little piece of the object and see if the glow is gone. Okay, so that is, uh, that is set. Uh, one other thing we can do, we can take and render this to the, uh, to the cloud. I'm going to give this a, a shot here real quick. I'll click Render in Cloud. And I must save the drawing file. See if it does that for me automatically. Yeah, there we go. When you render to the cloud, uh, you, you have to have an account. I've got in the documentation how you can create an account. Um, so basically what it's going to do is e-transmit this drawing up to the cloud. It's going to render it there, and then I can view the image online. Uh, when you upload this, it'll ask you what, what views do you want to render. Okay, if you want to render every camera, you can go ahead and do that. I'm just going to render the final view, and uh, you know what? Notify me by email when it's complete. Let's click Start Rendering here. And if you look, you can see it just created an e-transmit and sent it up uh, on the server. And then you can see the little wheel spinning there. It's uh, processing. Now, if you get, uh, if you get a little um, uh, anxious, you want to see how things are going, uh, you can choose Render Gallery. I'll sign into the, uh, to the account here. We'll see if we can see how things are going. I just realized that we're recording this, so I just gave everyone in the world my email address. So send me a message if you want to. That's perfectly fine. Yeah, exactly right. Um, here's, the, uh, here's the rendering. You can see it rendered in 22 seconds. Let me click on this and see if uh, we, can, we can pull this up. Now, the first time you render on the cloud, um, you won't be uh, really happy with it. Uh, it renders it draft. Okay, it, it takes everything and renders it draft. A couple things about the cloud. It will show your light sources. Not unlike AutoCAD, it will show your light sources. Uh, if you want to render something high resolution, the, the way to render at high resolution is to upload it to the cloud first, like I did. Now that it's here in the gallery, if I, if I expand this, I can say re-render using new settings. And then I can go through and uh, you know, there's an environment setting here. If you, the background is what it should say. What do you, you want, a, like a barn in the background or something? I, I can't see the background anyway. Uh, render quality, best. File format, what type of image. Exposure, image size. So you can go through and, and dial this up uh, to whatever size you want. 
you will find uh, the the this will render it in probably like six minutes or so. Okay, or a lot faster than it will on the local machine. A couple things I can tell you about the uh, the cloud: the the renderings will not be identical to what you get from AutoCAD. They'll be nice. They won't be the exact same. So that's one thing I've I've found. Uh, this gallery will also show you. Uh, you know, here's that uh, here's that bottle. We'll see how quick that comes up. So you can see it looks a little different here than it did from AutoCAD. Okay, just keep keep that in uh, keep that in mind. Uh, with the service, you get they say you get 15 renderings. Okay, nobody's policing that right now. Uh, so you can render as much as you want. At some point, the hammer will come down, and you'll probably have to pay. You have to you know create some type of thing where you pay for it. But for right now, you can render as much as you want. Okay, uh, so nice. Uh, Nice functionality, great way to uh, render things uh, quickly. Let me go ahead and jump off of uh, this. And I've got the information how to create the account online there. Let's do one more, uh, one more thing here. I've got uh, nine minutes to go, which should just be perfect. Uh, we'll look at uh, creating animation here real fast. I've got a nice abstract scene. There's something timeless about uh, bowling pins. Uh, nothing creates a more immersive uh, environment than, than being able to move through your 3D model. Okay? So this is the model that we're going to be creating a, an animation from. Let me jump over to AutoCAD here real quick. We'll open up this drawing called Animation. There's my drawing. Okay. If I want to uh, create an animation, I'm going to use the animation panel. We turned that on earlier. All right. So let me go to my layer list here real quick. I've got a, uh, some geometry here on camera A, that layer. Let me turn that layer on. You can see my light sources here. Um, I've got a circle. This is going to represent the path of the camera. I also have a target right down here in front of the ball that represents the, tar the, the area where we're looking. Okay. To create an animation, really easy. Just going to click the animation button. I'm going to link the camera to a path. I'll click select objects and I'll select my path. You can give it whatever name you want. Let's just call it path one for right now. Link the target to a point. I'll click select objects and I will choose the node down here. Uh, once again, I'll keep the default name. So now camera set, target set. Over here we can create the animation. 30 frames a second is what it's set to right now. Number of frames 30 gives us a one second movie. Let's set this to 10 seconds. And then I'll come down and click preview. And when I click preview, if you watch the edge here, you'll actually see the camera moving around the object. Okay. Basically what that's going to do is create uh, essentially 350 or 300 renderings okay, to, to create that animation. So this this uh, same preview window through the camera, so you can see what it's going to look like. You can also adjust the visual um, uh, style here. So I'm going to say, you know what, this is perfect. This is ex exactly what I want. Let me go ahead and close that. And um, to complete the rendering, we will choose the visual style. To make this real fast, I'm going to change it to conceptual for right now. So it'll just be like those cartoon colors. I want to create a uh, Windows media file. You can also render this out as an AVI or an MPG. And over here you can adjust the resolution of your rendering. Uh, we'll keep it at 320 by 240 for right now since it's going to render 300 images. I'll go ahead and click OK when I'm finished and I'll save this out on the desktop. We'll just keep the default name and I'll click Save. There we go. It's done. We'll uh, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll jump back to the desktop here. Here it is. We'll uh, double click and take a look at our our movie. Okay. Um, you might want to take and establish uh, do some conceptual ones first before you take and dial this up to presentation. Presentation will take a a little bit of time. Um, one thing I just want to show you here real quick, you can see the horizon of my table uh, around the outside as this renders. That's why I use targeted lights. When we backed up, you saw those were all spotlights pointing in. That way I can't see that horizon. It just kind of fades to black. Let me show you real fast here what that rendering 
Here's a, a 15 second version at high quality. Now, how long did that take? 28 hours. Okay. This is uh, 350 or 400 images. A lot of glossiness in there, and I, it's at 800 by 600. So you, you can measure your animations in days, not, uh, not hours. Let me take and jump back over to AutoCAD real quick. Uh, we'll, do, uh, we'll do one last one here. Uh, there are three ways to create an uh, animation. You can do moving camera, stationary target. You can do um, stationary camera moving target. Okay, this is where the camera's in one spot and the, and the target follows a path. That's like a, a pivoting your head, looking around. And then there's also um, uh, moving camera, moving target. That's where you can give yourself a little, uh, little nausea. Let me turn on uh, camera C here. There's my path. So if I go to uh, animation here, We'll link the camera to a path. We'll accept the name. We'll link the target to a path. Same path. We'll do a 10 second animation here and I'll just click uh, preview. This will be like the fly through. Okay, camera and target are in the same location. If you start playing around with it, you can copy that path on top of itself, break the first six or seven inches off, Set the long one to the camera and the short one to be the target, and that way you're looking in the direction that you're, you're turning. You know, like I said, you want to get really crazy, you start separating camera and target, and then you're looking one way and moving another. And uh, uh, yeah, if you got a big monitor, make sure you have a, a bucket with you. So let's take and uh, we will go back. Yeah, we'll just go back here. All right, so after uh, running through the session, we had, a, uh, we had an aggressive schedule today. We've seen how to create a camera uh, and edit that camera. We've seen how to create targeted light sources. We've seen how to create bump maps, how to edit bump maps, and how they apply texture to our materials. Uh, we saw how we can clip our materials using a, a cutout image. Uh, we also saw some, some shortcuts for, for doing renderings quicker. Uh, and then finally, we, we talked about uh, generating some animations. Uh, that is probably one of the most addictive things you can do once you start doing the animations. That's a, uh, that's a good time. I'm leaving my, uh, up here's my contact information. Um, if, uh, I'd, I'd love if you create some renderings. If you wanted to take an email one to me, I'd love to, uh, love to see it. Uh, I've got my uh, Twitter account information up there. I, I take and regularly post uh, AutoCAD tips and tricks. Um, I'm not big into the social media. If you, if you, do, if you do follow me, you will, you will never find out about a bad taxi cab ride I had or how I'm stuck in the airport or you won't hear anything about uh, bad restaurant food. I don't, uh, I don't post that stuff. I only post uh, AutoCAD uh, helpful tips and things. So I've also got the, uh, I, I occasionally post to the company blog. Uh, that's in there. It's also in the handout. And then uh, uh, once again, the handout, the, uh, these drawings will be available to you um, as of uh, this weekend, I'll have them posted on the Dropbox account. You'll be able to take and download them. If for some reason you have any difficulty, just send me an email and I can, I can email them to you directly. So thank you for coming, and I, uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of AU. And if, yeah. Thank you.